Hello all, greetings from HLB Hunt. As we all know, around four years ago, the federal government has issued a few tax and regulatory compliance law. VAT or value added tax is the center point of discussion because it has led to several reporting requirements, compliance formalities and accounting changes. With the implementation of VAT, it has contributed to enhance the growth of the economy as it is providing a new source of income. Thereby, we can say that with the implementation of VAT, it has set a new and efficient taxation system in the country. VAT value added tax was introduced in 2018 and since then, the Federal Tax Authority has issued 25 VAT guides, 31 public clarification, a few of tax bulletins and several private clarification based on specific requests submitted by VAT registered entities independently. However, we still see that a lot of VAT registered entities face a lot of difficulties in finding the correct VAT treatment for the transactions that they face in their day-to-day -day business operations. However, amidst all of this ambiguity, the FTA has introduced VAT audits to find out on the VAT registered entities who are non-compliant to these laws and regulations. And it is observed based on our experiences and from the industry updates that they are leaving heavy penalties on those who are found as non-compliant. In this interactive session, we have our tax partner, Mr. Jay Krishnan, and our audit partner, Mr. Sumesh, who will be providing insights into the non-compliances found during a financial audit and the other non-compliances that was observed in the FTA audits. And hence, we can ensure that today's video will provide insights into how you should be getting ready if you ever face with an occasion of an FTA audit. As auditors, uh, we believe that the VAT compliance is also one of the critical elements in the financial uh, statement preparation and reporting also. Okay. So similarly, I think accounting is the basic for the uh, tax accounting as well as the good governance and audit also. So as an auditor, I want to express a true and fair view of my client's financial statement. Where uh, recently we are seeing that uh, many of the SME level of clients doesn't have a proper understanding on some of the VAT elements and they are making mistakes and there are several non-compliances related to the tax accounting. So which leads some of them have heavy penalties as well mm -hmm. some of them may try, try to avoid the penalization period to some extent by doing some other kind of uh, accounting. So uh, this is really creating a, a huge penalty impact on the clients later. Sometimes the managers are not aware of these facts where the accountants are playing around to avoid their uh, uh, jobs. Yeah. So what's your opinion? Taxpayers with regard to the non-compliance are concerned. Uh, I would like to classify the taxpayers into two brackets. One, they take you know regular health check and proactive action not to get into a penalty situation. And there are some clients, group of clients where they don't, you know, care much, and uh, they, you know, they don't do any any caution, you know, not to get into the the, the penalty or non-compliances. Uh, the the problem now, you know, since the VAT is introduced for the last four and a half years, more and more, you know, if there are some non-compliances from day one, you know, it will accumulate, and this will be huge amount of penalty. So as a consultant. We always recommend the clients to, to you know do a proper health check or any kind of caution or a precaution or a checkup which ensure that you know they are broadly complied and there are no major non-compliances. Okay. So that means as an auditors and consultants, we have also an obligation to communicate the client that what is the non-compliances and where they need to fix the issue. Sure. And sure. the stakeholders also we need to communicate it properly, what would be the potential impact of the penalty. Even though there are several VAT guidelines are issued, but as a consultant, we have an obligation to give the client the right information and how to do the account. That's correct. That's correct. Mostly, if you see the, the, the market trend in, in UAE, especially, you know, many awareness sessions, like participating in an awareness session or, or any, any, any memo or a circular or a blog or anything, if you read, you can mostly understand the consequence of the non compliance. So, I strongly believe that you know attending those kind of sessions itself will give you a lot of value addition in terms of the, you know yeah. the, the, the importance of the compliance in India.
Pratika, can, can you explain about the transitional provisions, how it is impacting the clients? Yes, yes. See, transitional provisions are governed by Article 80 of the decree law, which clearly specifies about what is the transition value for VAT transactions. Any transaction which has entered on or before the VAT starts, commences, that means 1st January 2018, and which goes through the VAT period. Okay. Yeah, the, those transactions will be classified as transitional transactions. And the VAT impact on those transactions, you know, the, the Article 80 very specifically defines, you know, what is the VAT impact on those transactions. Say, I would like to put up one example. Yeah, a, a customer entered into a contract before 1st January 2018 mm -hmm. and this contract prolongs for the next say six months or one year and it, it which was initially accounted as an advance payment in, in 2017 or 2016 whatever yeah and that value since it's an ongoing transaction and, and it, it's spreading into the VAT and non-VAT period mm -hmm. we, we have to be careful on, on the value of the quantum or the value of transactions which is booked for the year 2018 or on or after 1st January 2018 and eventually we would be or we are supposed to capture the VAT on those transactions. Okay. From my experience, you know, I have seen that many of the customers make mistakes on booking the VAT on those transactions, especially the transition period, mm -hmm. which eventually will end up with heavy penalties. Okay. FTA, you know, started doing audits for the clients. Initially, FTA was doing the audits from beginning, but now if you see latest you know the, the frequency and the number of audits has been increased and from my experience i have seen that you know these transitional provisions are one of the main area where fta auditors are looking at i see okay so that means uh, according to me i believe that the transition pro provision have a validity period while we are uh, uh, implementing the vat in 2018 so it means that uh, still it is valid especially where the companies having a continuous supply like uh, real estate companies or construction companies or project based companies correct. still they should be very careful on what they are carrying from the beginning that's correct. in the transitional period so uh, as a uh, auditor i think this is a key audit matter part which we need to look into the financials properly and alert the audit committee as well as the board of directors or the uh, owners of the organization and as based on your 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 uh, words that uh, if FTA is increasing their audit, so these people also having a huge impact if they were not complied properly. So as an auditor, I need to look on that what would be the impact on their financial statement and according to the IFRS guidelines, the necessary provisions also needs to be accounted on time in order to reflect the right financial position and results to the company. That's correct. That's what I believe, right? That's correct. So even even I suggest that you know if not done previously the the the, the health check or the verification on the on the transition provision, it will you know it's 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 very essential that you know most of the clients who has a long term contract, especially like you mentioned real estate you know real estate construction takes long time so those transition period has to be independently reviewed by an ex expert and then make sure that you know VAT is properly captured. regarding the revenue transactions so usually uh, the VAT have a big impact on that so uh, as an auditor we usually focus on the IFRS Act let's say the revenue transactions are generally classified on three segments literally the IFRS 15 that is called revenue from contract with the customer then IFRS 16 that is leases then IFRS 9 were the revenue from the financial installments so IFRS 9 generally uh, it belongs to the banks and financial institutions where they are making the uh, revenue from the financial instruments. 
when i am for a 16 generally follows for the leasing companies or equipment companies or real estate companies something like that or somebody who is having that kind of revenue and all other revenues are usually classified under ifrs 15 where uh, there is a five step criteria needs to recognize the revenue apart from that what we generally seen is that there are many companies having other incomes other incomes that usually in the form of reimbursement of expenses from the related parties or service charges from the related parties and gain or uh, uh, gain on uh, property plan and equipment disposal sort of things so what we seen is that uh, some of them doesn't have a proper invoice let's say the gain on uh, property plan and equipment hand doesn't have a right invoice or sometimes service charges between the uh, related parties doesn't have a right invoice it's only a cross charge so according to my understanding if the related parties are falling into one vat group then only there is no need for a vat separate invoicing all other uh, invoicing can be done even though if it is a related party or entities under common managing entity they need to raise a vat invoice even though service charge or reimbursement of expenses right i mean the audit you know normally when i say audit fpa audit fpa no, mostly they require a reconciliation between the the the, the value we declared through the vat return and the financial statements you know reconciliation can be in different forms i would like to classify or, or point out few of the examples where mostly we make mistakes on classification of expenses in the financial statements which fta normally you know find out during the audit say for example classifying a transaction as zero rate instead of putting it as a standard rate or we normally make mistakes on on you know expense reimbursement reimbursement or disbursement side okay yeah say for example telephone expenses reimbursement or you know insurance reimbursement etc which you know as per the law you have to book certain transactions in a way but you know we make normally mistakes or when you export you know there could be two element of exports one you know transactions within you know the, the country that means local transaction and it could be fully export transactions so those two legs like, so of tra- transactions have to be separately captured and accounted for vat we m- make mistakes on that and another scenario is you know local leg of international transactions mm-hmm. that is also an area where mostly clients make mistakes and uh, if you see the other area like service say for example if we render a service to someone but we invoice to a non resident individual or to a non resident company but you know the service is against certain physical goods located in uae so normally we have a tendency to classify those transactions as zero rated whereas these are actually standard rated okay so these are the cases where you know we normally uh, book mistakes in the, in the on the classification of transactions in the financial statements so what i feel is that you know someone has to thoroughly review the classification side which technically called as coding hmm. or or tax coding okay tax coding uh verification or or a thorough verification on the tax coding can point out all these mistakes so that we will not end up with you know a, a non compliance okay it means that the, the either the client have a pe- people who is having deep knowledge on the vat which they need to chart out uh, the normal pro, uh, codes which is aligned with their chart of account that's that's what it is in ue there are many free trade zones are working so most of the uh, companies who is having the large operations having office in free zone or company in free zone and they have mainland offices and they do a lot of transactions between the mainland office and the designated zone offices so according to me as an auditor we look into the revenue perspective so what we usually look into that that the, how the revenue uh, the company is generating and how they book it actually so according to the ifrs angle we have only two classifications basically over the time revenue recognition and at the point of time recognition then apart from that when you look into this uh, kind of import export even it is a designated free zone uh, designated zone to the mainland it's uh, i think it is treated as an import and export kind That's of transaction right. so we usually look into the caf and fob terms of only so in caf terms also sometimes uh, we need to look into what is the delivery conditions and how it is satisfied there may, may be x work and sort of things so what is you, your view on the fpa and, and how the client needs to do this kind of transactions 
yeah fundamentally uh, the 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 vat impact on transactions between designated zone to the mainland and vice versa normally that is you know purely depending on the encoders okay uh, like sumesh you suggested like caf or or you know x work whatever the encode terms make a lot of difference in on on you know booking the vat transactions for the transactions between the designated zone to the mainland i would like to put up one example yeah say if you follow ddp terms mm -hmm. yeah ddp terms specifically mention that the the obligation of sending the goods from the designated zone to the premise of the customer in the mainland mm -hmm. you know west with the supplier okay so i am a designated zone company and it's my obligation to make sure that i pay all the duty i pay all the taxes before i clear the goods from the designated zone okay and then it's my obligation to make sure that the goods reach your premises in the mainland okay so okay. technically speaking you know i take the goods i clear the duty i pay all the uh, you know necessary taxes in ue and then 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 send the goods to you okay. which means the ownership or the place of supply is transferring in the mainland okay so those transactions if the terms are dup for vat purpose this is counted as a local supply you know eventually we have to book 5% taxes on those transactions if oh, the terms are ddp okay we normally make mistakes from designated zone to the mainland you know if we don't look the the clear you know in code terms and then blindly book the transactions you know on an assumption that all the transaction between designated zone to the mainland mm -hmm. i strongly disagree on that i recommend everyone to look the clear in code terms on every transaction before the, the vat is been booking so ddp terms would be falling under the standard rate of supply even though the sale is happening between designated zone to the mainland mm -hmm. but yes i agree x works if all the conditions are fulfilling x works transactions can be counted as a either as an outer scope or a zero rated whatever mm -hmm. but there is no vat element involved on those transactions so verifying the in code terms you know make sure that we do that someone do that before we book the vat transaction between uh, designated zone to the mainland okay That, that 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 means the clients really needs to look on the VAT compliances, as well as the their sales contract or the FOD CAF terms, the FOB terms should be clearly mentioned in line with the VAT compliance. Exactly. That's right. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, as you mentioned that uh, while uh, moving the goods from the designated zone to the to the mainland, uh, what about the out of scope scenario and zero rated tax scenario? can you reconfirm that how yeah it's a, it's a, it's a good question i would like to you know put up one example on that say i already mentioned you know x work in, if the encode terms are x work the the place of supply is in the designated zone so those transactions are very clear these are out of scope and if the terms are ddp and the place of supply happens in the mainland that would be counted as a standard rate sales and you know this will prevail even if the importer of records are someone else say even if you book the your name or your prn is used as as a importer of records and the rcm is booked in your name you know we should not look into that we have to really look what is the actual inco terms associated with that transaction Like I have a question related to the legal ownership and uh, the asset ownership of the companies because as an auditor while we do the audits we seen that in many scenarios the group companies or maybe the standalone companies have many licenses like industrial license trade license sometimes one company in required uh, more manpower so they took additional license and they took the uh, manpower on that particular license or if a dubai company needs a, a contract needs to get a contract in abu dhabi so they plotted another license in abu dhabi to get that particular contract and um, but uh, generally the accounts are kept at a single consolidated entity wise there is no separation between the uh, licenses or companies similarly some company have assets which they are uh, registered in that company name but the revenue expenses everything is accounted in the other company and uh as the same way some of the company what they do is that the owners have their personal assets registered in their name which the entire revenue and expenses are accounted in the company even though they are no transfer of the ownership 
So what, what is your point on this aspect? Because I heard that the FDA is particularly looking out there, giving more clarification in that because the asset is there, there only they need to account the revenue and expenses. So in the individual perspective, so the individual person also needs to maintain and take the right registration sort of things or how it could be. Yeah. See, if you see in the in, in practically, uh, there are many business owners who own assets. When you own asset, the, the tax obligation, you know, belongs to you, the owners. Mm -hmm. That is a fundamental concept. So if you do a business, either by yourself with that asset, directly, you, it is your obligation. Okay. Yeah, it's very simple. You have to book the transaction. But there are cases that you own the asset, but practically to manage it, you entrust or you engage this asset to someone and you tell them to, to manage those properties and then you know th there is a profit sharing arrangement this is a bit uh, tricky yeah the, the, the fundamentally the law say that the, the who own the asset you are responsible for booking the vat transaction so when you engage an agent third party agent to manage your property or an asset what is going to be the, the scenario on the vat that is the question so for that uh, there is a separate article in the VAT resolutions which say that you know th th they have defined it into two categories. One is agency transactions are two types. One are you know disclose the agency transactions. Other second categories are undisclosed. Mm -hmm. You uh, you put your name or you allow the agent to use your name in all the documents. Those transactions are called disclosed agent transactions. It's very simple that you know the the the, the final end user comes to know who is the real owner of that property those transactions the law specifically mentioned that you know the since the, the, the it's a disclosed transaction disclosed agent transaction it is obligation of the the owner of the asset to book the vat transactions not the agent okay, okay. but in the other case undisclosed agent transactions you know these are a bit complicated when you don't disclose your name the owner's name into the, the documents so the final end user will not comes to know who is the real owner of this property so those transactions you know, it does not mandate the owner to book the transactions on every supply. Instead, it can be booked by the agent who okay. makes the real transaction. I see. In those scenarios, you know, there, there could be an initial transaction between the owner and the agent. Mm -hmm. That has to be separately captured. So in, in total, uh, you know, when you engage an agent or when you don't engage an agent, the, 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 the fundamental law will be applicable, which means that who owns the asset? And if the, the, the user know the owner's name in any of the documents, then, then it's obligation of the owner to capture the tax. Okay. And then, then comply the, the, the regulations, all the compliances. Okay. So as an auditor perspective, what, what I need to advise my client is that wherever uh, generally the assets are belongs to the, which company they need to account. That is a fundamental role. That's a fundamental yes. role. And they need to keep the separate books of accounts also in entity wise. If you disregard the personal element in that exactly. entity to entity, they need to keep the separate books of accounts. So what is the level of uh, penalties or non-compliance issues in the FTA in this perspective? So this would be a very complicated later. The problem, I, I will put one example. Yeah, if if, if you are as an owner, if you are supposed to book a transaction, but you, have, you fail to book it, you know, on an assumption that this is managed by an agent. I'm not managing the property, instead someone else is managing it. But if it's a disclosed agent transaction, yeah, we have seen in practically in many of the real estate company that, you know, I own mm -hmm. property, I entrust to a real estate company, either that company owns myself or mm -hmm. to a third party, mm -hmm. it does not matter. Mm -hmm. There is a separate company, yeah. I, I individually own this property, but my company manage it. Okay. Even if that is the case, I am supposed to book the transactions in individual name in my books of account. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we fail to book it. So what happens is, FTA mandate you to book it. So we, we have to, I have to personally register, I have to book the transactions, I have to file the returns, all the transactions originally I have to correct it. Okay. You know, the, all the transactions, any transaction which is booked by the agent or my company has to be revised to my name. Okay. This is going to be very laborious in terms of, you know, especially like four and a half years, five years transactions has to be revised. Mm -hmm. So the voluntary disclosures, uh, you know, late penalties, Late registration penalty, separate thing will be applicable, okay. which is going to be very, very heavy penalty amount. Okay. Okay. Understood. Related to the documentation of transactions, especially when we look into the export import, 
So as an auditor, what we usually do is that uh, if it's a sales transaction, we usually start verifying the quotations, sales invoices, delivery notes, and shipping documents. Similarly, in the purchase side also, we look for the purchase orders, then uh, for purchase bills, then goods received notes, then shipping documents, then the proof of the payment. Then when coming to the real, uh, real, uh, related party transactions, what we usually do is that we ask the contracts between the related parties, what are the services they have entered into it, then their periodic invoices, then the confirmations. So these are the usual procedures we follow, especially the revenue related or kind of purchase related transactions. So, and, and we know that the, the, there is a, some time period which is mentioned that at least five years period or seven years period it depends upon where the, the registrar needs to keep all the documentation either in the hard copy or soft copy form. So, can you explain me the what compliances and issues what are currently going with the clients? Yes, with respect to documentation, see normally documentation uh, requirements are like either what you have to document, what to document, number one. Number two, uh, till what time or the time limit, you know. So these are the two important factors we have to be careful. You know, some of the documents and also the, the who is responsible for the documentation. Is it the, the supplier or is it the buyer? So who is responsible, what to document and what time period you have to document. These are the three important elements you have to consider for the, under the, the documentation uh, section. Now, if you see in the practical, practical uh, scenario, when you export, when you export the goods to the, 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 the outside UAE, mostly we make mistakes okay. yeah, on, on documenting because the FTA mandate all the exporters to document certain things like an example is an exit certificate. Exit certificate is a mandatory document to prove that you really you know, exported the goods to outside. Okay. And unless you produce this document, you are not qualified to book it as a zero rated transaction. Instead, you, this will fall as a standard rated transaction. Okay. So if we fail to document, you know, exit certificate. It's a mistake. It's a non-compliance, and FTA audit definitely will cover up this area, and then then they will you know classify those transactions from zero rated to standard rated, okay. which will be you know having a huge impact on the total tax value plus penalties, etc. Okay. Another area where we don't normally uh, you know look into is the formatting, invoice formatting. Okay. The invoice format we follow. You know, our income invoices we make wrong you know format. Uh, we have to follow the, the, the complete headings and the lines as for the regulations okay. into okay. the invoices. Otherwise, it's a non compliance invoices, which is going to be a uh, non compliance And also, when you get an you know, invoice from a third party suppliers, you know, you have to ensure that this is properly, uh, this is a proper tax invoice. Okay. And if, if someone verify and make sure that this is not fully compliant, then, then we are not allowed to claim any import taxes on, on those invoices and you have to keep all these bills or documents for certain time period okay. and uh, you know and, and other area would be like uh, admin admin uh, penalty admin exceptions we call it as a except admin exception you, FTA has given you a privilege to apply for admin exceptions in certain, certain cases if we don't do that then 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 it's again we unknowingly we are committing mistake but there are rooms or you know spaces where you can apply these uh, admin exceptions you know to to avoid the penalty but you know someone has to educate the customers to know what are the admin exceptions available from the FTA. so documentation makes a lot of you know you know importance because fta normally come for the inspection of the audit they ask for all these so my strong belief is that you know someone has to clearly verify and make sure that the documentation system which you follow you know is within the regulations and and also one you know regulate one one uh, mandate which FTSA is always about FTA audit charter or, or, or audit file you know they have given some points these are the minimum documents to be kept in, in, in any client's premises okay. this, this is a combo it's, it's a box of documents where you have to keep A, B, C, D whatever so you have to ensure that these are mandatory these are not uh, optional these are mandatory so the documentation is you know very important in terms of VAT compliance is concerned and then, then non-compliance might happen if you fail to document properly. Okay. So, JK, so during the discussion, what I understand is that the compliances are gaining more momentum now. So, it's not a free country to do whatever they want uh, before the 2018. The business also needs to be more vigilant on their accounting treatment 
as well as the documentation, the transitional provisions, as well as the classification of transactions. So while corporate tax also will come into the picture, so everybody needs to be very particular and very diligently they need to reassess their accounting systems, the documentation systems, and they need to do periodical audit or review from their part as well as the third party involvement, whatever it is, in order to make sure that this will be proper in their, their accounting systems or the documentation systems are at par with the FTA regulations as well as corporate tax regulations in order to minimize the penalty implications. Because th this penalty implications while corporate law also coming, I think this will be an enormous impact to the clients. Yes. So I think this is a summary. What is your uh, point? Yeah, that's correct only. See, the, the points what we discussed, uh, like rightly mentioned, you know, all the points are pointing to certain non-compliances. Mm -hmm. So whatever we discussed, you know, we discussed about, you know, how to comply in a better way. But people who don't comply, you know, they, they cannot, you know, like they are within the bracket of non-compliance. Anytime FTA can come up and then, then they can, you know, identify the uh, transactions, which is going to be having a huge impact. So what I suggest again, you know, like I initially mentioned, you know, doing a proper health check and then taking all the cautions to ensure that, you know, I'm fully compliant, you know, is the only option where, you know, you, you can save the penalties from the FTA side. And especially like, you know, in UAE, most of the company do export transactions. We, we make the, the documentation mistakes on exports in most of the cases. So we have to ensure that, you know, the, you know and, and also certain, you know, real estate transactions, real estate company, especially when the transition provisions are involved. You know, these are the area where we have to be careful and then, then ensure that, you know, we, we double check and uh, make sure that I have done the proper compliance in terms of VAT sunset. And even a small mistake will lead to a huge penalty because this is starting from 2018 retrospective effect. Oh. So oh. at the earliest, that is a concept. Okay. At the earliest, you do a due diligence, health check, review, make sure that you know I'm doing I am I'm compliant. That is the only way you can identify. Otherwise, you keep on doing mistakes during your, your lifetime. And you know, FTA does not say that I'm going to come next year, this month, next month. No, they can come anytime. So they come, they ask the documentation system and they ask the procedural system. So if you are not ready with that, then, then you know, this is going to be an issue at a later stage. Okay. There are several other key areas to be considered, such as revenue reconciliation with the financial statements and VAT return, preparation of audit information sheet as per the FTA format, administrative delay in providing audit information, eligibility of input VAT claim, intercompany tax treatment and audit impact, wrong interpretation of date of supply rules, deemed supply provisions, agreement review, taxability of supply related to the goods located within UAE, and other relevant issues. Thank you all for watching this video. Hope it has provided you with insights on how to prepare yourself in case of an FTA audit. Uh, we at HLP HAMT offers expert services on all of these issues, so feel free to contact us for any assistance.